The next presentation will be that of the case against the defendant, Frank, which will be presented by Lieutenant Colonel Baldwin. We shall now deal with the individual responsibility of the defendant, Frank. In accordance with the expressed desire of the tribunal, this presentation has been strictly limited. I, of course, should welcome any direction from the tribunal as to length or method as I proceed. Firstly, I must acknowledge my indebtedness to Ms. Harriet Zetterberg of our legal staff and to Dr. Piotrowski of the Polish delegation for their invaluable work. Dr. Piotrowski and the Polish delegation naturally have an especial interest in the defendant Frank. Aspects of the criminal complicity of the defendant Hans Frank under count one of the indictment have been placed before this tribunal on several occasions. There remain, however, certain matters for discussion, either novel in presentation or in development, concerning this defendant as an individual before the United States portion of the prosecution's case against him is completed. Our Soviet colleagues will carry further the heavy complaint against the defendant Frank in their treatment of war crimes and crimes against humanity in the East. We wish here merely to touch upon that evidence, which we believe irrefutably discloses Frank to have been a tremendously important cog in the machine which conceived, promoted, and executed the Nazi common plan or conspiracy. Documents relating to this point have been assembled in a document book bearing the letter double F, I am informed. These books, as, as well as explanatory briefs, I think have been distributed to the tribunal. Reference will be made in the course of this argument to the so-called Frank Diary, portions of which have already been brought to the attention of the tribunal. It seems appropriate that brief mention should be here made of the content and source of this diary. It is a set of some 38 volumes, most of which are on the table at the front of the courtroom, detailing the activities of the defendant Frank from 1939 to the end of the war in, in his capacity as general governor of occupied Poland. It is a record, in short, of each day's business, hour by hour, appointment by appointment, conference by conference, speech by speech, and in truth, we believe, crime by crime. Each volume, excepting the last few, as the court will observe, is handsomely bound. And in those volumes, which deal with the conferences of Frank and his underlings in the general government, the name of each person attending the meeting is inscribed in his own handwriting on a page preceding the minutes of the conference itself. It is incredibly shocking to the normal conscience such a neat history of murder, starvation, and extermination should have been maintained by the individual responsible for such deeds. But by now, the tribunal is well aware that the Nazi leaders were sentimentally fond of elaborately documenting their exploits, as witnessed the Rosenberg volumes displaying the looted art treasures and the album reporting on the extermination of Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. The complete set of the Frank Diary was found in Bavaria at Neuhaus near Schliersee on 18 May 1945 by the 7th American Army. It was taken to the 7th Army Document Center at Heidelberg 
and on or about 20 September 1945, the collection was sent to the office of U.S. Chief of Counsel here at Nuremberg. It is here in, it, in court in its entirety, and now its tones we submit are those of accusation rather than boastful narration. That the defendant Frank held a position of leadership in the Nazi party and in the German government is undeniable. Even, uh, presumably, it would be unfair to the defendant Frank to underestimate his importance in the Nazi hierarchy and the Third Reich. Like the other defendants in this case, he was a man of far-reaching influence and position, and his office holding record is already before this court. It is an affidavit signed by the defendant Frank <coughs> and identified as USA Exhibit Number 7. This document contains a listing of 11 important positions held by Frank in the party and in the government and supports the assertion of influence and position which I have just made. Especially since this tribunal has been fully apprised of the criminal activities of the Nazi organizations and formations. The machinations of Frank divide themselves logically into two periods. In the one from 1920 to 1939, he was, by his own admission, the leading Nazi jurist, although parenthetically the word jurist loses its reputable content when modified by the word Nazi. In the other period, extending from, from October 1939, until the end of the war, he was Governor General of Occupied Poland. While he is most notorious for his persecutions and carrying out of the conspiracy in the latter capacity, it is the opinion of the U.S. prosecution that the defendant Frank's contributions to the Nazi rise to power as the leading Nazi jurist should not pass without mention. It is with this aspect that I shall first deal, the defendant Frank's furtherance of the realization of the conspirators' program in the field of law, his knowledge of the criminal purpose of the program, and his active participation therein. <coughs> defendant Frank himself described his role in the Nazi struggle for power in the following words which remarks he ordered his secretary to place in the Frank diary on 28 August, 1942. The remarks appear in the diary and are translated in our document 2233PS-X, which if the court please, is at page 54 in the document book before it. The numbers of the pages of the document book will be found in the upper right-hand corner in colored pencil, either red or blue. What page did you say? At page 54, sir. 54. The original of this document I now offer in evidence as USA Exhibit 607. In the German text, these extracts appear in part three of the 1942 diary volume on page 968, 969, and 983, and I now quote, <coughs> Frank says, I have since 1920 continually dedicated my work to the NSDAP. As a National Socialist, I was a participant in the events of November 1923, for which I received the Blute Orden. After the resurrection of the movement in the year 1925, my real greater activity in the movement began, which made me, first gradually, later almost exclusively, the legal advisor of the Führer and of the Reich leadership of the NSDAP. I was thus the representative of legal interests of the growing Third Reich in a legal, ideological, 
as well as in a practical, legal way. He goes on to say, the culmination of this work I see in the Leipzig Army trial, in which I succeeded in having the Fuhrer admitted to the famous oath of legality, a circumstance which gave the movement the legal grounds to expand generously. The Fuhrer indeed recognized this achievement and in 1926 made me leader of the National Socialist Lawyers League. In 1929, Reich leader of the Reich Legal Office of the NSDAP. In 1933, Bavarian Minister of Justice. 1934, President of the Academy of German Law, founded by me. And in December 1934, Reich Minister without portfolio. And in 1939, I was finally appointed to Governor General for the occupied Polish territories. So I was, am, and will remain the representative jurist of the struggle period of National Socialism. I profess myself now and always as a National Socialist and a faithful follower of the Fuhrer Adolf Hitler, whom I have now served since 1919. It is uh, indeed significant and worth mentioning to the court. Is this an extract from his diary? Yes, sir, it is. And uh, the words uh, present Dr. Hans Frank and others, are those written by him in his diary? Yes, sir, they are. <coughs> Before each of these excerpts, if your honor please, if it was a conference, <coughs> it was indicated which members of the government general were present or who uh, made the address. It is indeed significant and worth mentioning to the court that the defendant Frank assumes responsibility for the so-called oath of legality at the Leipzig army trials. At that trial in 1930, Three army officers were accused of, curiously enough, conspiracy to high treason. The charge was that the defendants in that trial, in their capacity as members of the German army, tried to form national socialist cells in the German army and to influence the German army to such an extent that in the case of a putsch by the National Socialists, the army would not fire at the National Socialists, but would stand at ease instead. All three of the officers were found guilty and sentenced to 18 months confinement. At that trial, however, Hitler was a witness. And during the course of the trial, testified under oath that the term revolution used by him only meant spiritual revolution in Germany and that the expression heads would roll in the sand meant only that they would do so as the result <coughs> of legal procedure through state tribunals if the National Socialists came to power. This, if the court please, was the so-called oath of legality, the lie that the defendant Frank provided his Fuhrer as a facade for the conspiracy, and of which he at least in 1942 considered the culmination of his efforts. <coughs> as the representative jurist of the struggle period of National Socialism, and in the various juridical capacities listed in his affidavit of positions held, Defendant Frank was, between 1933 and 1939, the most prominent policymaker in the field of German legal theory. For example, Defendant Frank founded the Academy of German Law in 1934, 
and he was president of this once potent body until 1942. The statute defining the functions of this academy conferred upon it wide power to initiate and coordinate juridical policies. <laughs> this statute appears in translation at page five in the document book as our document 1391 PS and appears in the 1934 Reichsgesetzblatt at page 605. We ask the court to take judicial notice of it. I now quote briefly from the decree. It is the task of the Academy for German Law to further the rejuvenation of the law in Germany. Closely connected with the agencies competent for legislation, it shall further the realization of the National Socialist Program in the realm of the law. This task shall be carried out through well-fixed scientific methods. The Academy's task shall cover primarily, one, the composition, the initiation, judging and preparing of drafts of law. Two, the collaboration in rejuvenating and unifying the training in jurisprudence and political science. Three, the editing and supporting of scientific publications. Four, the financial assistance for work and research in specific <coughs> fields of law and political economy. Five. I'm sorry to read all this, but we thought we'd take judicial notice. All right, sir. Among the early tasks which the defendant Frank set for himself as policymaker in the field of law were the unification of the German state, the promotion of racial legislation, and the elimination of political organizations other than the Nazi party. In a radio address given on 20 March 1934, he announced success in these matters. Our partial English translation of this speech appears as document 2536 PS at page 64 in the document book, page 64. The official text of this speech appears in Documenta der Deutschen Politik, volume two, pages 294 to 298. In the German text, the extracts which I shall quote appear at page 296 and 298, and I will ask the court to take judicial notice of these passages. First task was that of establishing a unified German state. It was an outstanding historical and juristic political accomplishment on the part of our Fuhrer that he reached boldly into the development of history and thereby eliminated the sovereignty of the various German states. At last we have now, after 1,000 years, again a unified German state in every respect. It is no longer possible for the world, based on the spirit of resistance inherent in small states, which are set up on an egotistical scale and solely with a view to their individual interest to make calculations to the detriment of the German people. That is a thing of the past and for all times to come. I pass on now to the second excerpt. The second fundamental law of the Hitler Reich is racial legislation. The National Socialists were the first ones in the entire history of human law to elevate the concept of race to the status of a legal term. The German nation, unified racially and nationally, will in the future be legally protected 
against any further disintegration of the German race stock. I pass now to the mention of the sixth. The sixth fundamental law was the legal elimination of those political organizations which within the state during the period of the reconstruction of the people and the Reich were once able to place their selfish aims ahead of the common good of the nation. This elimination has taken place entirely legally. It is not the coming to floor of despotic tendencies, but it was the necessary legal consequence of a clear political result of the 14 years struggle of the NSDAP. In accordance with these unified legal aims, Frank continues, in all spheres, particular efforts have for months now been made as regards the work of the great reform of the entire field of German law. As a leader of the German jurists, I am convinced that together with all strata of the German people, we shall be able to construct the legal state of Adolf Hitler in every respect and to such an extent that no one in the world will at any time be able to dare to attack this legal state as regards its laws. End of quote. In his speech uh, on the occasion of the day of the Reich University professors of the National Socialist Lawyers League on 3 November 1936, the defendant Frank explained to the gathering of professors the elimination of Jews from the legal field in accordance with the Nazi plan. Our partial translation of this speech appears as document 2536 PS at page 62 of the document book. The official text appears likewise in Documenta der Deutschen Politik in volume four pages 225 to 230. I ask the tribunal to take judicial notice of this. It deals, to summarize. I don't think you need read it. All right, because we've already had uh, documents uh, of the same right. sort. As the leading Nazi jurist, the defendant Frank accepted, condoned, and promoted the system of concentration camps and of arrest without warrant. He apparently had no hesitancy in subverting his professional ethics, if any he had, while subverting the legal framework of the German state to Nazi ends. He explains the outrageous departure from civilization <laughs> that were concentration camps in an article on legislation and judiciary in the Third Reich published in 1936 in the official journal of the Academy of German Law, of which, of course, he was the editor. The partial translation of this article appears as our document 2533 PS at page 61 of the document book. It appears, the official German text of the extract appears in Zeitschrift der Akademie für Deutsches Reck, 1936, at page 141, and I will ask the tribunal to take judicial notice of this. Since the extract is short, I will ask permission to read it. Frank says, to the world we are blamed again and again because of the concentration camps. We are asked, why do you arrest without a warrant of arrest? I say, put yourselves into the position of our nation. Don't forget that the very great and still untouched world of Bolshevism cannot forget that we have made final victory for them impossible in Europe right here on our German soil. End of quote. It can be seen, therefore, that just as other defendants mobilized the military, economic, and diplomatic resources for aggressive war, the defendant Frank, in the field of legal policy, 
geared the German juridical machine for a war of aggression. Which war of aggression? As he explained in 1942 to the NSDAP political leaders of Galicia at a mass meeting in Lemberg, I now quote from the Frank Diary, our document 2233 PS-S at page 50 in the document book, the original of which I offer into evidence as USA Exhibit 607, which war of aggression had for its purpose, and I quote, to expand the living space for our people in a natural manner. Was that page 50? Yes, sir. very short quote, sir. The distortions and warpings of German law, which defendant Frank engineered for the party, gave him, if not the world, vast satisfaction. He reported this to the powerful Academy for German Law in November 1939, one month after becoming Governor General of occupied Poland. This speech is partially translated in our document 3445 PS at page 73, page 73 in the document book. The official text of the speech appears in Deutsches Recht, 1939, volume two, the week of 2330 December 1939, beginning at page 2121. And I will ask the court to take judicial notice of this, but would ask permission to read the excerpt as it's very short. Frank stated, today we are proud to have formulated our legal principles from the very beginning in such a way that they need not be changed in the case of war. For the rule, right is that which is useful to the nation, and wrong is that which harms it, which stood at the beginning of our legal work, and which established this collective term of nation as the only standard of value of the law. This rule dominates also the law of these times." End of quote. If this sentiment has a familiar cut to it, it is because it is a restatement of a party commandment, tailored and refurbished by the party lawyer to fit the party's concept of law. I allude, of course, to the party commandment commented upon on page 1608 of the official English transcript of these proceedings in the treatment of leadership corps, which command commandment stated, I quote, Right is that which serves the movement and thus Germany. It follows, I think, that the prosecution conceives the defendant Frank to be jointly responsible for all those cruel and discriminatory enabling acts and decrees through which the Nazis crushed minorities in Germany and consolidated their control over the German state and prepared it for its early entry upon aggression. It matters not, in our view, that the signature of this lawyer does not appear at the foot of every decree. Enough has been shown in our submission to indicate culpability in this regard. There is sufficient, we believe now in the record, and I refer to decrees cited by Major Walsh in his treatment of persecution of the Jews, and by Colonel Storey in his treatment of the Reich cabinet to demonstrate that type of enactment and the consequences thereof for which we hold the defendant Frank liable. In following this theory, may it please the tribunal, we are only arriving at conclusions already arrived at for us by the defendant Frank himself. I now pass to that second and well-known phase of the defendant Frank's official life. 
wherein he for five years as chief party and government agent was bent upon the elimination of a whole people. He was appointed governor general of the occupied Polish territories by a decree signed by his then Fuhrer on 12 October 1939. The decree defined the scope of Frank's executive power and is contained in our document 2537 PS at page 66 in the document book. I shall ask the tribunal to take judicial notice of this since it appears in Reichs Gazette's Blot 1939, part one, 2077, page. It merely states that Dr. Frank is appointed as governor general of the occupied Polish territories, that Dr. Seiss Inkart is appointed as deputy governor general, and that the governor general shall be directly responsible to me, meaning Hitler, he having signed the decree. While some of the outside world was prone in earlier days to wonder at the apparent efficiency of Nazi administration, we now know that it was often riddled with the petty jealousies of small men in positions of some authority and with jurisdictional fractiousness. No such difficulty exists with the defendant Frank, however, for though he was not without the threat of divided authority, he insisted upon <clears throat> and was granted the favor of supreme command within the territorial confines of the general government. Only two references <clears throat> from his diary, one in 1940 and one in 1942, are necessary to show the all-inclusiveness of his direction and authority. At a meeting of department heads of the general government on 8 March 1940 in the Berg Academy, the defendant Frank clarified his status as governor general and these remarks <coughs> appear in the diary and in our document 22-2233-PS-M at page 42 in the document book the original of which I offer in evidence as USA Exhibit 173. In the German text, the extracts appear in the <coughs> department head meetings volume for 1939 and 40 at pages six, seven, and eight. I now quote, Frank says, one thing is certain, the authority of the general government as the representative of the Fuhrer and the will of the Reich in this territory is certainly strong. And I have always emphasized that I would not tolerate misuse of this authority. <coughs> I have allowed this to be known anew at every office in Berlin, especially after Herr Field Marshal Goering on 12 February 1940 from Karen Hall had forbidden all administrative offices of the Reich, including the police and even the Wehrmacht to interfere in administrative matters of the general government. He goes on to say, there is no authority here in the general government which is higher as to rank, influence and authority than that of the Governor General. Even the Wehrmacht has no governmental or official functions of any kind in this connection. It has only security functions and general military duties. It has no political power whatsoever. The same applies here to the police and the SS. There is here no state within a state but we are representatives of the Fuhrer and of the Reich. 
End of quote. Later in uh, 1942, at a conference of district political leaders of the NSDAP in Krakow on 18 March, Defendant Frank further explained the relationship between his administration and the Reichsfuhrer SS Himmler. These remarks appear in the diary and in our document 2233PS-R and at page 48 of the document book. And I offer the original into evidence as USA Exhibit 608. In the German text, the extract to be quoted appears at page 185 and at page 186 of Diary Volume 1942, Part 1. I quote, as you know, says Frank, I am a fanatic as to unity and administration. It is therefore clear that the higher SS and police leader is subordinated to me, that the police is a component of the government, that the SS and police leader in the district is subordinated to the governor, and that the district chief has the authority of command over the gendarmerie in his district. This, the Reichsfuhrer SS has recognized. In the written agreement, all these points are mentioned word for word and signed. It is also self-evident that we cannot set up a closed shop here, which can be treated in the traditional manner of small states. I think all this has to be it uh, is considered important, sir, by the U.S. prosecution in view of the fact that this is a later extract from the diary. It indicates that two years later, even, Frank considered himself to be the supreme authority in the general government. This is a point which we conceive to be of importance, sir, but I shall... May I proceed? It would, for instance, be ridiculous if we would build up here a security policy of our own against our Poles in the country while knowing that the Poles in West Prussia, in Posen, in Vartalan, and in Silesia have one and the same movement of resistance. The Reichsfuhrer SS and chief of the German police thus must be able to carry out, with the aid of his agencies, his police measures concerning the interests of the Reich as a whole. This, however, will be done in such a way that the measures to be adopted will first be submitted to me and carried out only when I give my consent. In the general government, the police is the armed forces. As a result of this, the leader of the police system will be called by me into the government of the general government. He is subordinate to me or to my deputy as a state secretary for the security system. End of quote. At this juncture, it is appropriate to mention the man who filled the position of State Secretary for Security in the general government was Frank's higher SS and police leader, Kruger. May it please the tribunal, I shall come to that excerpt later. Yes, sir. It uh, seems more appropriate in another capacity. The tribunal may recall that the reports of the extermination of Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto were made in the spring of 1943 by SS leader Stroop, who immediately supervised the operation, to this same Kruger who was still at that time one of the two most influential members 
of Frank's cabinet as State Secretary for Security. It was inevitable that the grand conspiracy or common plan should have as its component parts a host of small plans, each dealing with a particular sphere of activity. These plans, differing from the master plan only in size, are the blueprints for specific action drawn from the broad policies. Occupied Poland was no exception to this rule. The plan for the administration of Poland was contained in a top secret memorandum of a conference between Hitler and the chief of the OKW, defendant Keitel, entitled Regarding Future Relations of Poland to Germany and dated 20 October 1939. This report was initialed by General Varlamov. It is our document 864 PS and may be found at page three of the document book. And I shall offer it into evidence as USA exhibit 609. I shall quote if the court please only from paragraphs one, three, four, and six. Paragraph one, the armed forces will welcome it if they can dispose of administrative questions in Poland. On principle, there cannot be two administrations. Paragraph three, it is not the task of the administration to make Poland into a model province or a model state of the German order or to put her economically or financially on a sound basis. <coughs> The Polish intelligentsia must be prevented from forming a ruling class. The standard of living in the country is to remain low. We want only to draw labor forces from there. Poles are also to be used for the administration of the country. However, the forming of national political groups may not be allowed. Paragraph four. The administration has to work on its own responsibility and must not be dependent on Berlin. We don't want to do there what we do in the Reich. The responsibility does not rest with the Berlin ministries since there is no German administrative unit concerned. The accomplishment of this task will involve a hard racial struggle which will not allow any legal restrictions. The methods will be incompatible with the principles otherwise adhered to by us. The governor general is to give the Polish nation only bare living conditions and is to maintain the basis for military security. Paragraph six, any tendencies towards the consolidation <coughs> of conditions in Poland are to be suppressed. Polish muddle must be allowed to, to develop. The government of the territory must make it possible for us to purify the Reich territory from Jews and Poles too. Collaboration with new Reich provinces, parenthesis, Posen and West Prussia, parenthesis, only for resettlement, parenthesis, compare Mission Himmler, end of parenthesis. Purpose, shrewdness and severity must be the maxims in this racial struggle in order to spare us from going to battle on account of this country again, end of quote. The defendant Frank was the chosen executor of this program. He knew its aims, approved of them, and actively carried out the scheme. The tribunal's attention has already been invited to USA exhibit 297, wherein, this may be found at page 1512 of the English text of the official transcript, the defendant Frank expounded the mission which is Fuhrer assigned to him and according to which he intended to administer in Poland. It contemplated in brief ruthless exploitation 
deportation of all supplies and workers, reduction of the entire Polish economy to an absolute minimum necessary for bare existence of the population, and the closing of all schools. No more callous statement exists than one Frank made in this report wherein he said, Poland shall be treated as a colony, the Poles shall be the slaves of the greater German world empire. In December 1940, Frank submitted to his department heads that the task of administering Poland did truly involve a hard racial struggle which would not allow any legal restrictions. I refer to our document 2233PS-0, which may be found at page 45, page 45 in the document book. <clears throat> it's taken from the Frank Diary, and I offer it into evidence as USA Exhibit 173. In the German text, the extract to be quoted appears in the volume of the diary entitled Department Heads Meeting, 1939-40, on pages 12 and 13. I now quote, in this country, the force of a determined leadership must rule. The Pole must feel here that we are not building him a legal state, but, for, but that for him, there is only one duty namely to work and to behave himself. It is clear that this leads sometimes to difficulties, but you must, in your own interest, see that all measures are ruthlessly carried out in order to become master of the situation. You can rely on me absolutely in this." End of quote. As for the Poles and the Ukrainians, Defendant Frank's attitude was clear. They were to be permitted to slave for the German economy as long as the war emergency continued. Once the war was won, even this cynical interest would cease. I refer to a speech before German political leaders at Krakow on 12 January 1944. It appears in the Frank Diary and is our document 2233PS-0. Double B at page 60, page 60 in the document book. It is the first passage on that page. I offer it in evidence as USA Exhibit 295. In the diary, the German text will be found in the loose leaf volume covering the period from 1 January to 28 February 1944 at the entry or 14 January 1944, at page 24. Once the war is won, Frank tells these leaders, and here we have, may it please the court, the classic example of the completely brutal statement, once the war is won, then for all I care, mincemeat can be made of the Poles and the Ukrainians and all the others who run around here. It doesn't matter what happens. End of quote. In accordance with the racial program of the Nazi conspirators, the defendant Frank makes it quite clear in his diary that the complete annihilation of Jews was one of his cherished objectives. In USA Exhibit 271, Frank stated in late 1940 in his diary that he could not eliminate all licensed Jews in a year's time. In USA Exhibit 281, he notes in his diary in the year 1942 that a program of starvation rations, sentencing in effect, 1,200,000 Jews to die of hunger should be noted only marginally. In USA Exhibit 295, he confided to a secret press conference that in the year 1944, and this too is from the diary, there were still in the general government perhaps 100,000 Jews. These facts, if the tribunal please, are from the diary of the man himself. 
We do no more here than to tabulate the results. The supreme authority within a certain geographic area admits that in a period of four years' time, up to 3,400,000 persons from that area have been annihilated pursuant to an official policy and for no crime, but only because of having been born a Jew. No words could possibly reveal the inferences of death and suffering which must needs be drawn from these stark facts. It was a Nazi policy that population, that the population of occupied countries should endure terror, oppression, impoverishment, and starvation. The defendant Frank succeeded so well in this regard that he was forced to report to his Fuhrer in 1943 that, in effect, Poles did not regard the general government with affection. This report to Hitler was a summarization of the first three and one half years of the defendant Frank's administration. It, better than anything else, can show the conditions as they then existed as a result of the conspiratorial efforts of the defendants. The report is contained in our document 437 PS at page two, page two of the document book, and I now offer the original into evidence as USA Exhibit 610. The German text, the extract to be quoted, appears at pages 10 and 11 of this report by Frank to Hitler, <coughs> dated 19 June 1943, regarding the situation in Poland. I now quote. Frank says, in the course of time, a series of measures or of consequences of the German rule have led to a substantial deterioration of the attitude of the entire Polish people in the general government. These measures have affected either individual professions or the entire population, and frequently also, often with crushing severity, the fate of individuals. He goes on. Among these are in particular, one, the entirely insufficient nourishment of the population, mainly of the working classes in the cities, whose majority is working for German interests. Until the war of 1939, its food supplies, though not varied, were sufficient and generally secure due to the agrarian surplus of the former Polish state and in spite of the negligence on the part of their former political leadership. Two, the confiscation of a great part of the Polish estates and the expropriation without compensation and resettlement of Polish peasants from maneuver areas and from German settlements. Three, encroachments and confiscation in the industries, in commerce and trade, and in the field of private property. Four, mass arrests and mass shootings by the German police who applied the system of collective responsibility. Five, the rigorous methods of recruiting workers. Six, the extensive paralyzation of cultural life. Seven, the closing of high schools, junior colleges, and universities. Eight, the limitation, indeed the complete elimination, of Polish influence from all spheres of state administration. Nine, curtailment of the influence of the Catholic Church, limiting its extensive influence, an undoubtedly necessary move, and in addition, until quite recently, the closing and confiscation of monasteries, schools, and charitable institutions." End of quote. Indeed, the Nazi plan for Poland succeeded all too well.
That's right. Was he, he was he saying that these measures were inevitable, or that he justified them, or what was he saying in the report? He is saying, sir, that one, the Polish people's attitude in the general government has substantially deteriorated. Yes. The reason for that deterioration are the listings that I gave to the court. In other words, listing. Is that all he says? No, sir, that's just taken from pages 10 and 11 of the report. The report yeah. is an extremely long one. Well, but I suppose you know what the general tenor of the report was? The general tenor of the report, sir, was in the nature of a complaint to Hitler that he, Frank, was having an extremely difficult time in the general government because of these measures and because of these happenings in the general government. <laughs> Yes. This is a report from Frank, you see. Yes. Mm. He's reporting to Hitler. And these are yes. the out of the things he did. Mm. Yes. Very well. In order to illustrate how completely the defendant Frank is identified with the policies. das Gericht an den Herrn Angagevertreter bereits die Frage gerichtet hat, was der Zweck dieses Dokuments ist, so möchte ich hier darauf hinweisen, dass es sich um ein 40 Schreibmaschinenseiten langes Dokument an Hitler handelt und das Frank gerade die von der Angabeschrift hier vorgetragenen Zustände verurteilt und in diesem Dokument umfassende Vorschläge macht, wie diese von ihm selbst auf das schärfste verurteilten Zustände beseitigt werden könnten. Ich werde, wenn ich an der Reihe bin, das ganze Dokument dann verlesen. Well, you will have... Exactly. You will have full opportunity, when it is your turn, to explain this document. I say exactly, you will have full opportunity when it is your turn to explain this document. But it is not your turn at the moment. Ich habe das jetzt nur erwähnt, weil das Gericht ja von sich aus die Frage auf diesen Punkt gebra äh, gebracht hat. Before he goes, you want, uh, one, more, one moment. He, he didn't give his name. And kindly state for the uh, purpose of the stenographers and the shorthand note uh, your name and for whom you appear. You appear for Frank, don't you? Jawohl, Rechtsanwalt Dr. Seidel, Verteidiger des angegabten Frank. Yes. Jawohl. But you understand it's necessary for it's necessary for the stenographers to get that. Each time. Each time. Jawohl. Yes. Ich bitte um Entschuldigung. Yes. I asked you, uh, what was the full content of the document 
from which you were reading this paragraph. Yes. And according to counsel for Frank, uh, the document, which is a very long document, shows that Frank was suggesting remedies for the difficulties which he here sets out. Is that so? Uh, that is so, yes, sir, Your Honor. Well, I, I think it would uh, be uh, appropriate... May I please the tribunal? Uh, I didn't cite this portion of that document, as I will later demonstrate, to show that Frank did or did not suggest remedies for these conditions, but only to explain that these conditions well, but, uh, existed as of a certain period. Uh, when you cite a small part of a document, you should make sure that what you cite is not misleading, having regard to the rest of the document. I see, Your Honor. Uh, I hadn't considered it to be such in view of the purpose for which I had introduced it, which, as I suggested, was only to indicate a set of conditions which existed at a certain time. I naturally assume that the defense, as Dr. Seidel has indicated, will carry on with the rest of the document as a matter of defense. Yes, of course, that's um, all very well, but uh, uh, the defendant Frank's counsel uh, will speak at uh, some remote date. And uh, it isn't a complete answer to say that uh, he will have an opportunity of explaining the document at some future date for counsel for the prosecution to make sure that uh, no extracts which they uh, that no extracts which they read uh, can uh, reasonably have a misleading make a mis misleading impression upon the mind of the tribunal I shall now state sir then that the extract which was just read was read solely for the purpose of indicating that at a certain period namely June 1943, those conditions existed in Poland as the result of statements by the Governor General of Poland. Would that be satisfactory to the tribunal? Well, what is not satisfactory to the tribunal is that you didn't give us the real purport of the document. Oh, well, sir, I don't have the complete document transcript before me now. Therefore, I can't read from all of it. No, well, I think uh, what we would like would be, if, if possible, if when an extract is made from a document, counsel who uh, are presenting that extract should uh, instruct themselves as to the general purport of the document so as to make certain that the part that's read is not misleading. In order to illustrate how completely the defendant Frank is identified with the policies whose execution is reported in this document and how thoroughly they were his own policies, and this at the tribunal please, regardless of what remedies he may have had in 1943, it is proposed in this last section to take passages from Frank's own diary in proof of his early espousal and execution of these self-same policies. As to the insufficient nourishment of the Polish population, there was no need for the defendant Frank to have waited until June 1943 to have reported this fact to Hitler. In September 1941, Defendant Frank's own chief medical officer reported to him the appalling Polish health conditions. This appears in Frank's diary and in our document 223S-P at page 46, page 46 in the document book, which I now offer in evidence as USA Exhibit 611. The German text is to be found in the 1941 diary volume at page 830. I quote, Ober medicinal rot, Dr. Walbaum expresses his opinion of the health condition 
of the Polish population. Investigations which were carried out by his department proved that the majority of Poles eat only about 600 calories, whereas the normal requirement for a human being is 2,200 calories. The Polish population was enfeebled to such an extent that it would fall an easy prey to spotted fever. Parenthetically, I think we know that as typhus. The number of diseased Poles amounted today already to 40%. During the last week alone, 1,000 new spotted fever cases have been officially recorded. That represented so far the maximum number. This health situation represented a serious danger for the Reich and for the soldiers who were coming into the government general. A spreading of pestilence into the Reich is absolutely feasible. The increase in tuberculosis, too, was causing anxiety. If the food rations were to be diminished again, an enormous number, an enormous increase of the number of illnesses could be predicted. End of quote. <clears throat> While it was cl crystal clear from this report that in September 1941, disease affected 40% of the Polish population, nevertheless, the defendant Frank approved in August 1942 a new plan which called for much larger contributions of foodstuffs to Germany at the expense of the non-German population of the general government. Methods of meeting the new quotas out of the grossly inadequate rations of the general government and the impact of the new quotas on the economy of the country were discussed at a cabinet meeting of the general government on 24 August 1942 in terms which leave no possible doubt that not only was the proposed requisition beyond the resources of the country, but its force was to be distributed on a grossly discriminatory basis. This appears from Frank's diary and in our document 2233 PS-E, which is at page 30, page 30 in the document book, which I now offer into evidence as USA Exhibit 283. The German text appears in the 1942 conference volume at the conference entry for 24 August 1942. I quote the following extracts. Before the German people, says Frank, are to experience starvation, the <coughs> occupied territories and their people shall be exposed to starvation. In this moment, therefore, we here in the general government must also have the iron determination to help the great German people, our fatherland. The general government, therefore, must do the following. The general government has taken on the obligation to send 500,000 tons of bread grains to the fatherland in addition to the foodstuffs already being delivered for the relief of Germany or consumed here by troops of the armed forces, police, or SS. If you compare this with our contributions of last year, you can see that this means a six-fold increase over that of last year's contribution of the general government. The new demand will be fulfilled exclusively at the expense of the foreign population. It must be done cold-bloodedly and without pity. End of quote. Defendant Frank was not only responsible for reducing the general government to starvation level, but was proud of the contribution he thereby made to the right. I refer to a statement made to the political leaders of the NSDAP on 14 December 1942 at Krakow. It is contained in the Frank Diary 
and is our document 223S33PS-Z at page 57, page 57 in the document book, and I now offer it in evidence as USA Exhibit 612. In the German text, the extract appears in the 1942 diary volume, part four, at page 1331. Dr. Frank is speaking. I will endeavor to get out of the reservoir of this territory everything that is yet to be got out of it. He continues. When you consider that it was possible for me to deliver to the Reich 600,000 tons of red grain, and in addition, 180,000 tons to the armed forces stationed here, further, an abundance amounting to many thousands of tons of other commodities, such as seeds, fats, vegetables, <coughs> besides the delivery to the Reich of 300 million eggs, etc., you can estimate the significance this territory possesses for the Reich. In order to make it clear to you the significance of the consignment from the general government of 600,000 tons of bread grain, you are referred to the fact that the general government, by this achievement alone, covers the raising of the bread ration in the greater German Reich by two-thirds during the present rationing period. This enormous achievement can rightfully be claimed by us. End of quote. Now as to the resettlement of Polish peasants, which Defendant Frank mentioned secondly in the report to Hitler. Although Himmler was given general authority in connection with the conspirators' pro project to resettle various districts in the conquered Eastern territories with racial Germans, the projects relating to resettling districts in the general government were submitted to and approved by the defendant Frank. The plan to resettle Zamosh and Lublin, for example, was reported to him at a meeting to discuss special problems of the district Lublin by his infamous State Secretary for Security, Higher SS and Police Leader Kruger, on 4 August 1942. It is contained in Frank's diary and in our document 2233 PS-T at page 51, page 51 in the document book, which I now offer in evidence as USA Exhibit 607. The German text appears in the 1942 volume of the diary, part three, pages 830, 831, and 832. I now quote from the report of the conference. State Secretary Kruger then continues, saying that the Reichsfuhrer's next immediate plan until the end of the following year would be to settle the following German racial groups in the two districts, Zamosh and Lublin, 1,000 peasant settlements, one settlement per, per family of about six for Bosnian Germans, 1,200 other kinds of settlements, 1,000 settlements for Bessarabian Germans, 200 for Serbian Germans, 2,000 for Leningrad Germans, 4,000 for Baltic Germans, 500 for Volnia Germans, and 200 settlements for Flem Flemish, Danish, and Dutch Germans in all 10,000 settlements for 50 to 60,000 persons. Upon hearing this, the defendant Frank directed that, and I quote, the resettlement plan is to be discussed cooperatively by the competent authorities and declares his willingness to approve the final plan <coughs> by the end of September after satisfactory arrangements had been made concerning all the questions appertaining thereto, parenthesis, in particular, the guaranteeing of peace and order, parenthesis, so that by the middle of November, 
as the most favorable time the resettlement can begin. End of quote. Uh, Mr. Bill will be adjourned now, Mr. Timmy. The way in which the resettlement at Zamash was carried out was described to Defendant Frank by Kruger at a meeting at Warsaw on January 25, 1943. The report is contained in the Frank Diary is our document 2233PS-AA and appears at page 58 in the document book. I offer the original of it into evidence as USA Exhibit 613. The German text appears in the Labor Conference volume for 1943. <laughs> at pages 16, 17, and 19. Kruger, in this excerpt, reports that they had settled the first 4,000 in the Christ Zamash shortly before Christmas, that, understandably, friends were not made of the Poles in the resettlement program, and that the Poles were forced to be chased out. He then stated to Frank, and I quote, <coughs> We are removing those who constitute a burden in this new colonization territory. Actually, they are the asocial and inferior element. They are being deported, first brought to a concentration camp, and then sent as labor to the Reich. From a Polish propaganda standpoint, this entire first action has an unfavorable effect. For the Poles say, after the Jews have been destroyed, then they will employ the same methods to get the Poles out of this territory and liquidate them just like the Jews. End of quote. Kruger went on to mention that there was a great deal of unrest in the territory as a result. And Frank informed him, that is Kruger, that each individual case of resettlement would be discussed in the future exactly as that one of Zamash had been. Although the illegality of this dispossession of Poles to make room for Germans <coughs> was evident, and although the fact that the Poles were not only being dispossessed, but sent off to concentration camps, the resettlement projects continued in the general government. The third item mentioned by Frank, the encroachments and confiscations of industry and private property, was again an early Frank policy. He explained this to his department heads in December 1939. The report is from his diary and is our document 2233PS dash K, and it appears at page 40 in the document book, page 40. I now offer it in evidence as USA Exhibit 173. The German text appears in the department head's conference volume for 1939-40 at the entry for 2 December 1939 at pages 2 and 3. Dr. Frank states, principally it can be said regarding the administration of the general government, this territory is in its entirety, in its entirety, is booty of the German Reich, and it thus cannot be permitted that this territory shall be exploited in its individual parts, but that the territory in its entirety shall be economically used, and its entire economic worth redound to the benefit of the German people. End of quote. Reference is made to USA Exhibit 297. If any further support of an early, early policy of ruthless exploitation is deemed necessary by the tribunal. In addition, the decree permitting sequestration in the general government, heretofore pointed out 
to the tribunal. Per Ordnungsblatt for the General Gouvernement, number 6, 27 January 1940, page 23, which decree was signed by the defendant Frank, permitted and empowered the Nazi officials to engage in wholesale seizure of property. This was made the easier by the undefined criteria of the decree. The looting of the general government under this and other decrees has already been presented to the tribunal on 14 December 1945 under the subject heading Germanization and Spoliation of Occupied Territories. And the tribunal is respectfully referred to that portion of the record and in particular to that segment dealing with the general government. The defendant Frank mentioned mass arrest and mass shootings and the application of collective responsibility as the fourth reason for the apparent deterioration of the attitude of the entire Polish people. In this too, he is to blame. For it was no part of defendant Frank's policy that reprisals should be commensurate with the gravity of the offense. He was, on the contrary, an advocate of the most drastic measures. At a conference of district political leaders at Krakow on 18 March 1942, Frank stated his policy. This extract is from the diary, is our document 2233PS-R, and will be found at page 49, at page 49 in the document book. I offer it into evidence as USA Exhibit 608. The German text may be found in diary volume for 1942, part one, pages 195 and 196. I quote Frank's statement. Incidentally, the struggle for the achievement of our aims will be pursued cold-bloodedly. You see how the state agencies work. You see that we do not hesitate before anything and stand whole dozens of people up against the wall. This is necessary because here simple consideration says that it cannot be our task at this period when the best German blood is being sacrificed to show regard for the blood of another race. For out of this, one of the greatest dangers may arise. One already hears today in Germany that prisoners of war, for instance, with us in Bavaria or Thuringia, are administering large estates entirely independently, while all the men in a village fit for service are at the front. If this state of affairs continues, then a gradual retrogression of Germanism will show itself. One should not underestimate this danger. Therefore, everything revealing itself as a Polish power of leadership must be destroyed again and again with ruthless energy. This does not have to be shouted abroad. It will happen silently." End of quote. And on 15 January 1944, Defendant Frank assured the political leaders of the NSDAP that reprisals would be made for German deaths. These remarks are to be found in the Frank Diary in our document 223S, 2233PS, double B, at page 60 in the document book, the second quote on that page, <laughs> the original of which I offer into evidence as USA Exhibit 295. The German text appears in the loose leaf volume of the diary, covering the period from 1 January 44 to 28 February 44, and appears at page 13. Frank says, quite simply, I have not been hesitant in declaring that when a German is shot, up to 100 Poles shall be shot too. End of quote. The whole tragic history of slave labor and recruitment of workers has been placed before this tribunal in great detail. When the defendant Frank <coughs> refers to these methods as his fifth reason for disaffection in Poland 
in his report to Hitler, he once more cites policies which he executed. Force, violence, and economic duress were all supported by him as means for recruiting laborers for deportation to slavery in Germany. This was an announced policy, and I have already alluded to USA Exhibit 297, which contains verification of this fact. While in the very beginning, recruitment of laborers in the general government may have been voluntary, these methods soon proved inadequate. In the spring of 1940, the question of utilizing force came up, and the matter was discussed at an official meeting at which the defendant Seiss Inkart was also present. I refer to the Frank Diary and our document 2233PS-N, which the tribunal will find at page 43 in the document book. I offer the original in evidence as USA Exhibit 614. The German text appears in the diary volume for 1940, part two, at page 333. I quote the conference report. The governor general stated that the fact that all means in form of procl proclamations, etc., did not bring success, leads to the uh, conclusion that the Poles, out of malevolence, and guided by the intention of harming Germany by not putting themselves at its disposal, refused to enlist for working duty. Therefore, he asks Dr. Frauendorfer if there are any other measures not as yet employed to win the polls on a voluntary basis. Reichshauptamtsleiter Dr. Frauendorfer answered the question negatively. The Governor General emphasized the fact that he will now be asked to take a definite attitude towards this question. Therefore, the question will arise whether any form of coercive measures should now be employed. The question put by the Governor General to SS Lieutenant General Kruger, does he see the possibilities of calling Polish workers by coercive means, is answered in the affirmative by SS Lieutenant General Kruger, end of quote. In May 1940, at an official conference, and this record is already before the tribunal as USA Exhibit 173, Defendant Frank stated that compulsion in recruitment of labor could be exercised, that poles could be snatched from the streets, and that the best method would be organized raids. As in the case of persecution of the Jews, the forced labor program in the general government is almost beyond belief. I refer to the Frank Diary and to our document 2233 PSW, which will be found at page 53 in the document book, 53, the original of which I offer into evidence as USA Exhibit 607. This excerpt is a record, if the court please, of a discussion between the defendant Salkel and the defendant Frank at Krakow on 18 August 1942 and appears in the diary volume for 1942, part three, at page 918 and at page 920. Dr. Frank speaks. I am pleased to report to you officially, party comrade Salkel, that we have up till now supplied 800,000 workers for the Reich. He continues, recently you have requested us to supply them with a further 140,000. I have the pleasure in informing you officially that in accordance with our agreement of yesterday, 60% of the newly requested workers will be supplied to the Reich by the end of October and the balance of 40% by the end of the year. Dr. Frank continues. Beyond the present figure of 140,000, you can, however, next year reckon upon a higher number of workers from the general government, or we shall employ the police to conscript them. 
end of quote. How this recruitment was carried out by wild and ruthless manhunt is clearly shown in USA Exhibit 178, which is in evidence before the tribunal. The starvation, violence, and death which characterized the entire slave labor program of the conspirators was thus faithfully reflected in the administration of the defendant Frank. There, of course, were other grounds for uneasiness in occupied Poland, which the defendant Frank did not mention in his report to Hitler. He does not mention the concentration camp, perhaps because, as the representative jurist of National Socialism, defendant Frank had himself defended the system in Germany. As governor general, defendant Frank, we feel, must be held responsible for all concentration camps within the boundaries of the government general. These include, among others, the notorious camp at Majdanek, near Lublin, and Treblinka, outside of Warsaw. As indicated previously, defendant Frank knew and approved that Poles were taken to concentration camps in connection with resettlement projects. He had certain jurisdiction as well in relation to the extermination camp, Auschwitz, to which Poles from the general government were committed by his administration. In February 1944, his ambassador, Counselor Dr. Schumberg, suggested a possible amnesty of Poles who had been taken to Auschwitz for trivial offenses and kept there for several months. This conference, court please, is reported in the Frank Diary and is contained in our document 2233 PS double B at page 60 in the document book and is the third quote on that page. I offer the original evidence as USA Exhibit 295. Going too fast. Yes, sir. Did you pay, say page 17? Uh, page 60, sir. 60. The German text appears in the loose leaf volume covering the period 1 January 1944 to 28 February 1944 at the conference on 8 February 1944 on page 7. I quote, the Governor General will take under consideration an amnesty probably for 1 May of this year. Nevertheless, one must not lose sight of the fact that the German leadership of the general government must not now show any sign of weakness." End of quote. This then was and is the conspirator Hans Frank. The evidence is by no means exhausted, but it is our belief that sufficient proof has been given to this tribunal to establish his liability under count one of the indictment. As legal advisor of Hitler and the leadership corps of the NSDAP, defendant Frank promoted the conspirator's rise to power. In his various juridical capacities, both in the NSDAP and in the German government, defendant Frank certainly advocated and promoted the political monopoly of the NSDAP, the racial program of the conspirators, and the terror system of the concentration camps and of arrest without warrant. His role early in the common plan was to realize the national socialist program in the realm of the law and to give the outward form of legality to this program of terror, persecution, and oppression which had as its ultimate purpose mobilization for aggressive war. As a loyal adherent of Hitler and the NSDAP, defendant Frank was appointed governor general in 39 of that area of Poland known as the general government. Defendant Frank had defined justice as that which benefited the German nation. His five-year administration of the general government illustrates the most extreme extension of that principle. It has been shown that defendant Frank took the office of governor general under a program which constituted in itself 
a criminal plan or conspiracy. As Defendant Frank well knew and approved, to exploit the territory ruthlessly for the benefit of Nazi Germany, to conscript its nationals for labor in Germany, to close its schools and colleges, to prevent the rise of a Polish intelligentsia, and to administer the territory as a colonial possession of the Third Reich in total disregard of the duties of an occupying power towards the inhabitants of occupied territory. Under Defendant Frank's administration, this criminal plan was consummated, but the execution went even beyond the plan. Food contributions to Germany increased to the point where the bare subsistence reserved for the general government under the plan was reduced to a level of mass starvation. A savage program of exterminating Jews was relentlessly executed. Resettlement projects were carried out with reckless disregard of the rights of the local population and the terror of the concentration camp followed in the wake of the Nazi invaders. This statement of evidence has been compiled in large part from statements by the defendant Frank himself, from the admissions found in his diaries, official reports, reports of his conferences with his colleagues and subordinates, and his speeches. It is therefore appropriate that a passage from his diary should be quoted in conclusion. It is our document 2233 PS AA, and it appears at page 59 in the document book, at page 59. And I offer the original in evidence as USA Exhibit 613. The German text appears in the 1943 volume of Labor Conference Meetings at the 25 January 1943 entry at page 53. In this address, Defendant Frank, prophetically enough, told his colleagues in the general government that their task would grow more difficult Hitler, he said, could only help them as a kind of administrative pillbox. They must depend upon themselves. We are now duty bound to hold together, and I quote Frank, we must remember that we who are gathered here together figure on Mr. Roosevelt's list of war criminals. I have the honor of being number one. We have, so to speak, become accomplices in the world historic sense. End of quote. This concludes the presentation on Defendant Frank. May it please the tribunal.